Uh, I'm Thierry Deduve, by the way. Um, very happy to interview Yan Hee Min tonight. Um, I'm an art historian for those of you who do not know me at all. Uh, and I teach at Hunter College. It, it happens, it so happened that I was here at the opening of Yanni's show, fell in love with the paintings right away. Um, they raised questions though. And then a few, a, what was it, uh, a week later or maybe not even two weeks later, we happened to be my wife and I in Los Angeles, and my wife Lisa Blas, who is here and who is also an artist, is a good friend of Yanni, and Yanni invited us for dinner. And there we were at dinner talking about painting, and um, Yanni said that she would love to have a dialogue with someone in the gallery. And uh, the questions and the exchange began, and at one point I said, stop, don't go any further. Let us not <laughs> rehearse it. Do you want to have a, do, would you like to have a conversation with me? She said, yes. And so here we are. And we have not <laughs> rehearsed anything. We have not prepared anything. We just wanted to share those, the questions that we, that we, uh, that I have about your work, that you might have about my reading of your work. Who knows? So my first question to Yanhi would be to perhaps introduce, her, introduce herself and her trajectory as an artist. I noticed that Yanni studied in Germany in the 90s and then at Harvard in 2000. And when did you get there? 2006? Mm -hmm. 2006. And that there is a little bit of a, a no man's land in between. Mm -hmm. And then, <laughs> the, 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 but, the, but the career in terms of exhibiting and so on had started already. How would you describe your beginnings? Um, I would say I, I've been making work, artwork for uh, about 20 years, um, practicing artwork. Um, and um, it, I didn't take a, a typical sort of trajectory uh, for today's standard. Um, I didn't. I finished my uh, undergrad and I studied painting in California. And then um, I didn't move on to a grad school right away. Um, and I went instead to, um, uh, went to Germany and went to the Kunst Academy in Dusseldorf, which is quite infamous, actually. Um, infamous. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, Boyce was no longer there, though. Boyce wasn't there, but he was, was still there, there <laughs> in you, some ways. Well, it, who it was, was among the teachers there? Oh, the roster of faculty was pretty crazy. Um, Richter was still teaching, uh -huh. and um, oh boy, um, Pank was there. Oh. Um, um, the Bechers were there. Um, Lupert was there. Um, incredible uh, array of artists that were teaching there at the time. And it with, was an, with whom did you take classes? I was in Gunter Ucker's class. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, he's a friend of mine. Oh, oh. yeah, I, like I his saw him paintings. in Los Angeles. Oh, that's a, that's amazing. Um, he was very gracious. Um, and so I was in his class and stayed there for a little bit over a year. I saw him recently, well, recently, I guess that's already three, four years ago. He was uh, participating in the Land Art Exhibition mm -hmm. in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. um, so, so it was, I guess it, part of me um, was really after some kind of an experience and not the not what I thought at the time to be a typical sort of graduate school experience. Um, so I put myself in a, uh, a place where I didn't know anyone and really didn't speak the language. Um, but in retrospect, of course, <laughs> the way you remember things, um, it was an interesting and very, 
is a sort of a character building experience. <laughs> and um, and um, yeah, I, I, I really am glad that I took that on at that time. Um, and then I returned to back to Los Angeles and started exhibiting work um, in galleries and um, different spaces. And um, the works that you exhibited at the time were they paintings or were they something in between paintings and objects or architecture? They were initially How would paintings. you describe them? They were initially hard-edged paintings. Mm -hmm. um, I was also, I started to work also in, um, to support myself um, in um, Hollywood, uh, mm -hmm. as they say, and uh, started doing production work, painting um, large uh, sykes. It's a stage, basically. You paint backdrops for um, camera, really. Um, so I um, was able to kind of understand and learn scale um, because I've had to mm. paint uh, sites that were over 20 feet high and easily 50, 60 feet uh, on the wall. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, so I was doing that, and then I was starting to exhibit work I also started to teach, and um, at the time, uh, the work was primarily uh, on wooden panels, and they were hard-edged abstraction. And some of them were shaped canvases, weren't they? The shaped canvases, um, and it led to shaped canvases. It led to shape. Yeah. And um, did, did your experience at Hollywood, which I, didn't, I wasn't aware of, uh, did that lead to the draperies that you would do late, much later? <laughs> Uh, you know these. Well, one is never there, knows. Is, I guess. is there is there a connection there? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I don't know. That's someone else just like to, to fear. I I don't know. You know, um, that's that's not an uninteresting and mm, question. And I I didn't think about it that way. Um, but the 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 drapes were for a particular space that was. Um, a site project, um, and it's right on here on 5th and 37th, which used to be the... Yeah, for CUNY. Uh, yeah. Yes, um, the, that was the first department store on 5th Avenue. And um, the space is really the store, uh, storefront space, and it's a space of display, and, um, and it, um, I saw it as an opportunity to uh, deal with this idea of theatricality and display in mm -hmm. a sort of a literal sense, and so so I. But went then you repeated this much later at the Hammer Museum. That yes, seems so a different a different usage of similar drapes, though. Yes, so those drapes, um, which I um, uh, the project was made uh, for Linda Norton's. Um, when she was the director there. Um, that project got recited, I, I like to call it. So recited? Recited. Uh -huh. Yeah. So um, and I had sort of imagined that that it would go somewhere else. And this was a this was a break for me in terms of thinking about side projects. Prior to that all my site projects were built in C2, and, and it was destroyed. Once the exhibition was over, then the walls were destroyed. Um, and so the, the curtain piece um, is a, a real sort of departure in terms of my thinking about site um, projects. And so it was recited to the Hammer Museum um, for, uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I was just thinking, how do you spell recited? <laughs> with an S or with a C? <laughs> it's a it's a site that re is re 
cited yeah, yeah. in the sense that Smithson spoke of non sight for example? Oh, yeah, is, yeah. Or is it a recitation of, <laughs> of something that you have done before? In that sense, it's recited with a C in the middle. That's interesting. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> or, or is it none of this or well, both? I think it probably involves a little bit of both. I think the way you speak about it, it does, um, it does answer to um, both, both meaning. Um, and um, so yes, yeah, so so um, the piece was piece now exists at the at a uh, terrace in at the Hammer Museum in Los Angeles, mm -hmm. um, and. Um, I feel like I'm sort of going off track, but going back to kind of my artistic trajectory. Um, so as I was doing these, uh, making paintings, um, I started to use uh, a very particular kind of paint, which maybe we can go into later. Um, but so uh, I was working, I was making paintings that are objects, and, and they insisted, looking back, that work really insisted on uh, being an object. It was an mm -hmm. important um, consideration for me for, for, for that, for the work from that particular time. So you, 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 you talked about ob paintings being object, you talked about theatricality a few minutes ago, um, that reminds me of a debate in the 60s, very much <laughs> around what Donald Judd at the time called specific objects, mm -hmm. which Michael Fried, on the other hand, accused of being theatrical. Mm -hmm. uh, was that, was, were the terms of that debate important for you at one point? Is that part of your education, or did you arrive at those words via another route? I wasn't thinking necessarily referencing Freed or Judd uh, specifically, um, but but I you know I mean I studied Freed and I read the I mean I studied essays and um, I guess it's it was I think the work. Uh, my awareness of the debate or the discussion um, and it sort of spoke through me in, in that work. Um, and at the same time, I was interested in what was happening on the surface. Mm -hmm. So there were different interests and um, that were happening at the same time. Do you see the interest in the object and the interest in the surface as being contradictory to one another? Well, not anymore, <laughs> but... Uh, but at the time? At the time, it was of, of concern to me and that I wanted the work to articulate that. I wanted the work to... Um, to sort of state that in the work. Were, were these pieces that consisted in oblique planes in space with bands of color, were they addressing that? Yeah, so um, yeah, um, I was making paintings during that time. At, at one point I decided I wasn't gonna deal with composition. Is I didn't wanna deal with the, comp pro the problem of composition. Mm -hmm. In other words, every time I make a painting, I didn't really have to think about where things go and deal with the, the, the problem of that. So, um, so I decided that every painting um, should have these vertical bands of color next to one another. So um, part of that thinking was also to, to really get to the color. In my mind, um, I was thinking to to reduce what I was what I didn't care about particularly, and to get to my my interest, which was color. But I think that it also carried other other sort of um, 
problems that, or other concerns that, that I didn't want to deal with. And like, like what? That you didn't want to deal with? Like what? Well, I didn't want to deal with the, the, the composition prob problem of uh -huh. the composition. But that also reminds me very much of uh, the debate of the 60s, mm -hmm. where Judd and Morris were against composition and, in fact, rejected composition mm -hmm. because it was, quote unquote, European. Did you share in, in any way those judgments? Well, I guess my, my thinking was more pragmatic. I mean, I mm -hmm. really wanted the, the object that you were looking at to, um, to speak of color and also the, just the phenomenological experience of standing in front of an object which led to this, these shaped canvases and mm -hmm. shaped, um, and, and these leaning walls. And, and so um, the walls that you are, you just mentioned um, were these site projects, site projects where, um, so if I were in a room like this, I would consider various different um, aspects of this room, and um, I would build a wall using conventional building materials, um, two by fours and sheetrock, and and then um, build a wall that would lean into the existing wall. So this is yeah, that's the the oblique things. Yeah. Yes. So um, so um, you know it was built into the existing architecture. Um, Yet, when you're uh, in front of it, um, it, it is also uh, an aestheticized surface because it had these colors on them. But those colors, were, were, not, were they not the, the, the famous mistints, as you yes. call them? Yeah. That is, uh, colors that were blended <laughs> by customers at some paint store and then yeah. this discarded because they didn't correspond to what they expected is can you yeah, explain so, um, because I'm not sure that I described this these things correctly so so what Thierry is talking about is um, what these these colors these these group of colors are called mist tints um, and what they are is um, they're custom mixed house paints um, that people go to a paint store and with a color chip or a little piece of, you know, existing. Uh, or a piece of fabric that, of the drapes that they have in the same room and they want the. Or a picture the, yeah, or, or something various like that. different mm -hmm. references and they would take it to the paint store and try to match this color and um, or have it matched. And, and for whatever reason, if it doesn't, it's not satisfactory, then they're, they're not uh, committed to buying it, purchasing it, so it gets left behind. And then as soon as it's rejected, it goes onto a shelf of <laughs> a bunch of other colors, and, and it gets marked down pretty severely. So um, there were, you know, I had different motivations for using these colors. They were, they were much, much cheaper than, you know, um, you know normal paint um, colors. And um, actually, I found quite a stock of these colors. Um, so I would pick them um, and work, made paintings with those colors. Um, there was something very seductive about their status being, you know, uh, rejected colors for, oh. for whatever reason. So, um, so some of your interpreters said that they were like ready-mades in to the second degree or something like <laughs> Like they're, they're ready-made, but because yes, to, I think to, you that. To, yeah. to, to make a ready-made you choose instead of making, mm -hmm. and here you choose those that were not chosen, mm -hmm. the colors yeah. that were not chosen. Yeah. So for someone like me yeah. who have uh, spent some time thinking about the ready-made in the tube of paint, yes. uh, that, then, that, this that, is, that then has this would be echo. a third iteration or third. But, but my question there is really because I want to begin slowly to discuss this show, and uh, the contrast between those paintings with ready-made rejected colors, yeah. which I strike me as being rather, if I may say, 
masochistic. <laughs> and, and the sheer pleasure of these paintings, the contrast is so enormous. Yeah. How do you bridge those two things? Um, it didn't happen overnight. Uh, <laughs> You know, um, it, it, it took its course. Um, um, well, I think, I, well, and then um, to just go back to my sort of trajectory, um, after ha having had exhibited work and for some time, I, I decided to return to school um, because I ended up doing um, quite fruit frequently these art, these site projects. And, and I started to really think about what I was doing with those works <laughs> and what my, what does it, what its relationship to architecture really was. And, and I was always interested in architecture. Um, so I, I needed to sort of sort the, things out and, and I took some time off. I really didn't make work. I didn't really show during those years. And um, so those years, when when was that? It's around 2006. That's when you graduated from Harvard. No, oh, I started. There. Oh, that's when yeah. you started. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then I started to use brushes again. I I wasn't making, let's say, serious work. I was just doing stuff in the studio. And, um, During your your years at Harvard, yeah. And with, with whom did you study there? Oh, I studied with Eve Blau and Michael Hayes at GSD. But I was also um, a teaching fellow at the VES at the art school, um, and worked with Stephen Prita oh, there. Yeah. Um, so I think that those were the times where I knew I had to sort of. Think, rethink painting I, um, and sort out, try to sort out what my relationship to painting and what my relationship to paint, architecture. And I think with the work prior to, let's say, that particular sort of break, um, I attempted the work to address everything, uh, both um, as a painting and architecture, and um, and that break led me to think about painting um, and in in a different way. And composition became interesting again. And would you um, say it's a more traditional way of looking at painting? Yeah, I think that would be. That would not be wrong to say that. I mean, I was interested in... Did, did you feel you had to liberate yourself from a, a sort of guilt for using paint? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I don't know if it was guilt. Was it guilt? I, you know, it was... I guess I needed to rationalize things to myself. Um, and while I was interested in the aesthetic experience of Paint, uh, the painting, I mean, I, I started to think more about visual pleasure. And actually That's a strange way to rationalize. <laughs> that, really? That, <laughs> so that's, that's exactly the opposite of what one would think of rationalizing. I, well, you know, it's, it's, as I said, my, I my trajectory you, is well, rather unpleasant. My formula was to say you had to liberate yourself from rationalization. And, uh, and there, you, your answer is to say, no, no, I had to rationalize that. Mm -hmm. So you, in other words, you had to give yourself the permission yeah. to have pleasure in painting. I'm going to be a little blunt here. Well, is, that, is, that, is that true? Well, um, I think it did. First of all, going back to school gave me a certain kind of permission uh, to sort of think about what I was doing and not to have to be in the studio and make work um, for the purposes of, you know, for whatever purposes. But it, it was just a much more private time and it was a much more solitary time for me mm -hmm. in those years. And um, so, yes, I bought paint um, in tubes and I was using brushes and I was 
doing very simple things that actually gave me a lot of pleasure. And, um, and I guess here we are. <laughs> that was some time ago, but... Um, so when did you start using the squeegee technique? So the squeegees came after um, I was doing some spraying. I was using a sprayer. With a spray gun or cans or what? Uh, with a spray gun. Um, so I was using a sprayer, which gave me a lot of... Um, when you're using a sprayer, it's really hard to... There's, there's only so much you can control uh, the process of spraying and... Um, while you're sort of moving around, moving your hands, moving your arms, you're not actually touching the surface. You're touching mm -hmm. the surface through this pressure from the sprayer that lands on the surface. And, and I'm, uh, my studio at this time was also partially um, sort of an indoor-outdoor um, environment. So mm -hmm. because of spraying, I would spray right. outside. You, you, you have and to have ventilation or else be outdoors. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so it, it, it brought in all these elements that were, um, that were out of my control. I mean, air moving movements and the light and condition. Did, would did, did you like that or did you resent the, the, the lack of control? I really liked it. You liked I really, it. really liked it. I, really liked that what I was, when I sprayed, it felt like I was, it, it, it always, there was a slight sort of, you know, it felt like I was kind of approximating gestures rather than really, um, really sort of putting it on the surface. It, it, um, it was an opportunity for me to actually uh, move around and um, and then be open to and literally to to these variables that I did not have did not have control over. So n n nobody nobody grows out of nothing. So were you aware of Seolitsky at the time? Yeah, was I he was... important for your spray paintings? Um, I had looked at Olitsky some time ago and. Um, while I really um, was interested in that work and liked that work, I don't think I really thought I was talking to that work at the time. Um, Are you talking to Frankenthaler's work? In this work? Or, or in, oh, in I see, in, in general. In general, but in this work, in this exhibition particularly, yes. The question I mean, would yeah, have yes. not been prompted otherwise. Yes and no. I mean, I think... Um, Olitsky, for instance, was super, he was really excited when he found the, t the, t the sprayer to be the tool. I mean, he, that he, you know, from what I have learned, he was just, this was just so exciting for him because it created this thing. Um, and, um, you know, I, I sort of relate to him on that level. It's a very, when, when artists do things in the studio and something happens that you didn't really expect, but, and you're not even sure what it is that you just did or if it makes sense, but there is something that you instinctively feel that that is something interesting. Something is happening and, and you have to return to it, you know, and you're not quite sure what it is. You can't identify it quite yet, but I, reading about Olitsky, I, I, I sense that excitement in, in his... Um, but wasn't he a little bit taboo at the time? Like, I don't know exactly, oh, because yes. I, I did not grow in your generation, so, so, but we went, as you know, we went through uh, Olitsky being championed by Greenberg and put in, in some kind of heaven, and then precisely because he had been championed by Greenberg, he was castigated by the next generation and put into, uh, uh, on the ash heap of history for so long. So it's kind of uh, surprising to see someone claiming that I, I'm happy to hear what you have to say about that. Yes, I'm aware, you know, uh, 
that I'm, I mean, I remember having, talking to people or, or studio visits or, you know, Litsky is not a name, a critical reference. It's exactly. not. But did you feel at the time that you needed those critical references? At which time? When I was, when I was maybe, making Maybe, maybe tell me a few times, like. I mean, when I started to make this work, um, I initially, I don't, I didn't feel the kind of affirmation, you know, when you talk about Olitsky uh, or Morris Lewis, um, but I guess I didn't really care that much. Um, and uh, you know, um, as someone, I mean, an old professor of mine said something, and this I remember for whatever reason, there was something that I took away with, and he told me that this was something about copying, the idea of copying, how that is not, uh, how, what that could mean, and not to say that I'm doing that, or I'm not suggesting that, but he told me, and I don't know if this is entirely true, and I didn't fact check, but he said something to, uh, he said that Norman Mailer, when he was a young writer, when he got out of school, he took the entire volume of Shakespeare and wrote it out by hand, copied. Fantastic, yeah. Yes. So this was, a, and that was an incredible sort of anecdote for me to think about and remember, um, because you learn it's, um, and it isn't the same thing. It isn't, um, it isn't a reproduction, let's say. Um, and that it's, um, it's a, way, it's a way, it's an opportunity for re, to regenerate or re-originate something that is... Um, but you said you never practiced it, literally. Practiced? The copy. Oh, did I practice? Yeah, no. You said, oh, you no. said no. No, I mean, I mean I'm, 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 I'm answering your question as to um, my speaking to, let's say, Olitsky, yeah. um, and that I feel that I have learned uh, by looking at that work, and um, yet I don't, and that there is probably something that's carried through um, and certain sensibility that I, um, that I respond to in that work. Um, Yet, um, the question is, you can't really reproduce that work, and I have to do my, my work. I mean, yeah, I have of to. Course. Let's talk about your work, because enough, <laughs> enough of uh, influences and, uh, and, and apprenticeship and all that. Um, I don't know where, oh yes, I, I probably I should start by start by asking you, how do you start? How do you start a painting? Uh, they, they seem, to me, so decisive that there is a sense of decision in those paintings. For example, this one, you know, there's like no remorse. Um, I was going to ask you, when is a paint, how do you begin a painting? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to throw a few questions at you because you don't have to answer them in that order. Um, when is a paint fi painting finished? and whether you allow yourself pentimenti, that is remorse, that's Italian for remorse, right? <laughs> <laughs> In which order? Okay. Well, well I'll start with the remorse. Well, uh, <laughs> yeah, maybe, why not? <laughs> uh, well, um, well, it's too late for that too, actually. But, um, well, um, I, I usually start with um, making my colors and these, the paint um, actually needs to be uh, mixed with uh, water and has to get to a certain consistency and viscosity that I like um, because these are made with squeegees. They're basically sort of uh, 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 passes that I make with these large squeegees that are uh, made for, you know, people use for different uh, 
things like the screen printing, for instance. Like, um, like what? Screen, print, screen printing. Yeah, things, screen yes. printing. Oh, so it's not just a squeegee that you wa oh, the, wash the, 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 windows. The, the windows with. <laughs> no. So um, once I mix my colors and um, I generally have, uh, would start with a group of colors that I, um, for whatever reason that I want to work with. Um, and then the painting itself um, starts with fields. Um, what I, so these large passes um, cover a good part of the canvas um, and and that gives uh, that gets rid of the white uh, canvas and gives me a place to start. And um, and no two passes are alike. I mean, every pass, it's 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 literally an um, a, basically a record of that moment or that time and however it ends up looking on the canvas um, is I can I can have uh, some idea what it might look like but it really the way it ends up being on the surface is uh, I could never know while I'm painting it mm -hmm. and well, so that was why my, my, my question about the pentimenti is that it seems so decisive that can you correct, can you not correct? Once you have done a passage, you can't really, it's there. really correct. You can't really correct. No. But you can change by adding. But I could change. And so sometimes I would make a couple of passes and, and um, I wouldn't know what to do next. And I find with these paintings, I also need a lot of time to to know what's 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 going on on the surface of the painting. So, do you um, let the, the sorry? Do you let the paint dry in between two passages? Yes, most of the time. Although these new these these this body of work or this series, this group of paintings, have actually have a lot of instances where wet paint is pushed through with another passes of wet paint and then um, and then things happen because they are in uh, they're both wet paint and as it dries things things sort of it, 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 it congeals basically. let's talk in examples there like the green band on the left I have this the impression but I'm not a technician at all so I don't know that it's like, like a chemical that's incompatible with the layer underneath and that mm -hmm. would react by, is that, is that the case or is it, is it just too wet, for example, or what, what no, is it? No, actually, it's right, you're right. The first, your first guess is right. The, oh. what's underneath um, is this sort of, it's a very sort of metallic color. Oh. So, um, so the metallic, the iridescent colors have a it slightly different absorb. makeup. It doesn't absorb as, in the same way, uh, the regular colors absorb. Do you gesso your canvases before you? Yeah, these are gesso surfaces, yes. And it's linen? Yes. And why is it linen and not cotton? Well, I like I Because like that you were we mentioning Morris Lewis, and I, I cannot imagine a Morris Lewis on, on linen. linen. Yeah. Um, I like um, I like the, the weave of the linen. I, I much prefer that. The canvas is a little bit bumpier yeah. and um, the just the texture and the weave of the canvas is different from from the, from the linen um, and I like the finer and the tighter actually uh, surface of linen better it's not really because linen is considered to be more you know it's a more precious material I mean I understand that but Really no, but that was not the meaning of my question. Yeah, no, I understand. It's more about yeah, the lead, those little knots that, yeah. that, that protrude, Canvas. but I don't see them in your paintings. Because these are the Because image. I would imagine that it would keep the squeegee and make a little bump and leave a little empty spot behind yeah. the passage. Or so. Does that yeah. happen? Well, I mean... It, it, it could happen more often. I mean, I've also worked on canvas uh, on some of them, and 
um, you can get canvas that does not have that that pronounced um, sort of uh, knots or uh, uh, so it, canvas can be pretty fairly consistent and even too, but but it's not quite like the linen. Um, um, and then, um, and then it's literally a process of looking at what's on the painting, and walking away from it, coming back, and and just making decisions and um, and and seeing what happens. And and it starts to become its own thing. It starts to. Um, have its own kind of spatiality. Yeah. Are you one of these painters who spent more time looking at the painting than actually <laughs> making it? Well, like I think in I, between? I take a great time, a, a quite a bit of time looking in between. And, and I find actually having time in between allows me to be able to look and see what is going on. Um, so that time is actually What do you do essential. if you have a bad surprise? Yeah, it's traumatizing when that happens, and um, <laughs> definite remorse. Okay. Um, so what do you what do you do then? Well, I I you, don't you look at it for a while. You intend to do something, it fails. What you have is something else. Yeah. How do you react? So I have to negotiate that through. It's an emotional thing, and sometimes my reaction to I don't always trust my initial reaction to what's going on. So I, mm. it would time that also allows me to just, it gives me distance to, to the thing. And so I can make a decision. Um, so, um, so it gives me, so time in between is, is definitely important. And then, um, and then you come back to it and then you, um, you, Often, I, what makes me uncomfortable, what makes me uncertain, um, I, I try to just give it time before I jump to the conclusion. So it's like the time it takes to accept a, a stranger in the family yeah, or something? It's, it's surprising, you, you know, you, sort of consistency and frequency and you start to become familiar, it becomes more film familiar to you, and then, uh, yeah, it's, it's a, it's a, it's, it's, it's Do you like sometimes a, find that the painting is too beautiful? Too beautiful. Um, I think that, um, I also have to, I also take time from that reaction too. Oh, so you do have that reaction. And then I sometimes. think, okay, because what I try to get to the painting to is a point where I feel there is um, there is enough. Um, it's where it's interesting, where it gets where there, where I feel there's enough complexity and enough interesting effects or, again, this sort of spatiality that happens. And it's different for each painting. And I, I try to get to that point, at which point I feel, OK, this does not need any more. It's not, I mean, I, I, that's. But what about too much? Too much? Yeah. That, that, that the painting doesn't need any more. Yeah. That's probably the point that every painter reaches when they say, that's it. It's done. Uh, yeah. I, I should not add a touch, not a brush stroke. Uh, but what about too much? I mean, I'm, it's really a question that, that your paintings raise. Like, too much flavor, too much <laughs> color, too much pleasure, yeah. too much jouissance. <laughs> they, 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 it's like, and even the palette, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm playing the devil's advocate here, but you know, it's almost like ice cream in those vibrant colors of pink and, and blue and turquoise and all that. And there, there we go. So 
Do you have that sense of too much sometimes? Well, um, I have to say, you know, it interests me that people, that there is that reaction, even not only on certainly my part, but other the viewers too, that what does it mean when it's too beautiful? What, what is, why is that threatening? Or why is that, a, why is that, yeah. uh, why is, is, why is that, is, should, why should that be resisted? Or, you know, the, the question of... Is it um, a genuine question? Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm curious about yeah. that. I'm, okay. I'm really interested it, why that is and what, what does it tap into about us or what, what, what is it, why is that uncomfortable? Um, so do you paint in order to solve that? Question sometimes, <laughs> yes. um, or to address it, let's say. Well, I think that I, I, I think that the work plays with that, um, and and I'm sometimes also surprised. I mean, it's also interesting when it's out like this, when it's in public. It's not in my studio anymore, and um, and to see people's responses and how they look in mm -hmm. in. In public, and um, you know, it interests me the, the idea of the beautiful and how, why that is. I'm, I'm, I'm reassured that 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 there is a a sort of a, a threat, or there is a kind of discomfort uh, with this idea of. Um, I, I don't feel discomfort uh, you don't with feel that. <laughs> no, no, but I feel the, the excess. Yeah. The excess. Like, and also, I wanted to ask you about, if, has anybody ever told you that your palette is Warholian? Warholian? Mm -hmm. I don't think anyone's mentioned it that way. Uh, have you ever thought of it yourself? And when you say that, do you mean the oh, for example, kind let's, of... The, let's take the, the first the magnificent huge painting at the entrance that yeah. faces the entrance. Yeah. And when you go from right to left, I don't know why I read it from right to left and not from left to right like you usually yeah. read, but I remember it's like a very acrid, pale, greenish yeah. yellow yeah. that melts into something else, maybe pink, violet, mm -hmm. and then ends with an orange, yellow, mm -hmm. after having. And, and you have, you, not so much in his paintings, but in his silk screens, mm -hmm. when Warhol does variation, mm -hmm. including, including subject matters uh, that are very tragic, such as the electric chairs, mm -hmm. they exist in these sugary, uh, flashy, mm -hmm. fluoresce, quasi-fluorescent colors, mm -hmm. and he would put he would put a pale green next to a pale yellow yeah. that are of same value. Yeah. He he was a great colorist in that sense. Yeah. And uh, do you have first of all, do you have affinity? Do you recognize that affinity? And second, did you did you integrate it consciously or maybe not consciously? Well, um, I think of these colors in the realm of the sort of synthetic. These are synthetic. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. Yeah, and, um, and um, I mean, I'm still interested in, in thinking, in, in working with that and, and, um, and seeing, um, uh, possibilities, um, but the, the the iridescence, uh, the effects that you're describing, is um, interesting. Also, in that it turns into almost like a screen-like effect when right, absolutely. You know, that's so. a, that has been said by by some. I don't remember if it's the first, but Jan Tumlier, for example, who writes on, on your paintings from a couple of years ago yeah. in this little book here, um, speaks of colors that you can only see very, very deep in the sea 
you know, like these, these Japanese fishes that nobody will ever see because they are so deep in the, in the sea that they are abyssal, but they are incredibly colored. They have yeah. unbelievably beautiful colors. Yeah. And he makes something out of, of that, the, the coming on the surface or the, or the showing of colors that were, in fact, not meant to be seen. Mm -hmm. That I found that interesting, but how do you react to that? I mean, you mentioned the artificiality of the colors yourself. You just said that they were synthetic. Yeah, I, I'm um, interested in these colors that are sort of have, I mean, colors for me are really ultimately about feelings. They are, um, they they fundamentally sort of resist um, uh, identification, or and they, while they, they, they're. I mean, there, there are multiple aspects of how a color actually um, affects, um, and we can also associate to different colors in different ways, multiple, multiple mm -hmm. ways. Uh, but I'm interested in the realm, not that this can be necessarily carved out, but in the realm of the experience of color um, beyond what it could uh, point to so that it becomes... Point to? Point to in the real world, you mean? Yeah. I mean, I think these, a lot of these iridescents you know, exist in nature. Uh, in the form of But insects. only where you cannot see them, well, except in flowers, perhaps. I think, I think that that's yeah. a really nice thing that what Jan says, I, I really like that. Um, but it also exists in insects and, you know... And, and, uh, and it exists on Times Square when you look at those gigantic uh, screens there yeah. with those extremely strong and synthetic colors. Yeah, those LED screens are pretty... That, is, that is why the Warholian connection, I think, mm -hmm. seems to me at least equally interesting to mm -hmm. explore mm -hmm. as the Maurice Lewis or Frankenthaler mm -hmm. connection. Mm -hmm. Even though I see, I see a lot of affinity between your work and Frankenthaler. Mm -hmm. uh, and maybe, maybe it's because both of you are women. Is that, does that a, is that a factor for you? Well, I mean, yes, but we're, so, we're such different. I mean, Frankenthaler's you know, um, we come from such different places and we have such different sort of histories. And so, yes, I mean, on a very general level, yes, but also very, I feel, I don't necessarily feel, I mean, there's, I also feel alienated from who she was, but I mean, I also see the work is, um, you know, uh, I, I, I am interested in what she did. Um, the surfaces, her surfaces are, my surfaces are very different from Franklin Dollar's surfaces, mm -hmm. entirely different. And uh, the way her paint sits on canvas mm -hmm. is so different from my, in the way these paints. So how would you describe the difference? Well, you know, I want to have my cake and eat it too. So. <laughs> So, yes, they're there, uh, they're clearly there, but I want them to also uh, uh, be, uh, have, an, have an immaterial presence as well. I want them to, to be perceptual. I would say that Frankenthaler's colors are absorptive. They, yeah. they pull you to the canvas and, and, and you, you push. Your colors push. Is that? I think that's interesting, yeah. yeah. I have another question regarding color uh, before I forget, and uh, with the connection between um, synthetic colors and natural colors. Yeah. And that is that um, as long as painting was figurative and was representing the real world, uh, color stood for light mm -hmm. in a way. Color stood for light. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, would you speak of your paintings in terms of light or just in terms of color? Well, I think these colors are colors through light without, 
maybe I'm not, maybe, let me, let me try to rephrase it. Um, I think about these colors, the way I'm using these colors often are also very, because of their translucency, they have this, they appear sort of luminescent because the light is yeah, able to travel through and so you, you're traveling through these surfaces and pigments of light and there are layers of colors and so the depth of different areas on the painting um, create a different sense of spatiality and... Which and brings us back to the flat screen yeah. of TV actually rather than rather than the tradition of, of painting in the sense of atmosphere through light and light through color. So, so you, mean, you mean the light emanating from the screen itself? Well, we, could, we, could, we could look at the whole history of modern painting in those terms, saying, for example, that the Impressionists were ca trying to capture the light. Monet is all about capturing the light. Yeah. Uh, and, but, but Seurat is all about forgetting the light and replacing it with digitalized color. Mm -hmm. and, and yet counting on the eye of the spectator to reconstitute some kind of atmospheric thing. Mm -hmm. But here is the, this other writer I love. I, I must read the, this to you because I, I think this paragraph is outrageous. Yes. You know, he's a, he's Daniel a painter. Him, he's a painter. He's a good friend of mine. He's a painter himself. So but listen to this. <laughs> the key difference, so, so he compares Yanni's paintings to Turner and Maurice Lewis in the same breath. Mm -hmm. And then he says, the key difference is that means abstractions do not swell with breezy, cool air in the same way as the work of either of those painters. Not by a long shot. There's nothing gray or cloudy in a picture. Absolutely well, well seen. There are not soothing or enveloping. There's no shady place to curl up. <laughs> The atmosphere in her paintings is about as breathable as the hot gas in a fluorescent light bulb. <laughs> and that's not the end, he adds, and this is outrageous. Uh, you might as well suck on the tailpipe of a running car. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I, you would be asphyxiated in three seconds. I don't uh, think, I don't I think, I, the last sentence is really That's over a the lot top. of Daniel in the last over sentence, the yeah. Let's call it an evening. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.